So as a first generation Dominican American, my mom had expectations. Go to college and be successful. Success meant a career in medicine, law, or business. But my love for the theater started in Fairbanks, Alaska at the ripe old age of five, where I was in a musical production called Showboat. My twin sister and I were in the children's cast, and we got to sing Captain Andy. I would then go on to have multiple leads in junior high and high school musicals, but college would be a different thing altogether. My mom had expectations. So my sister majored in medicine, my brother law, and business would be my option. <laughs> I entered UC Berkeley in 1979 as a business major, and computer science was one of my requirements. I would have to take either Pascal or Fortran. Pascal was developed in the mid-60s as a programming language used in teaching. Fortran was developed in the late 50s by IBM um, in response to engineering and scientific applications, those that required complex mathematical computations. Being the true creative that I am, the thought of being in a class with mathematical computer geeks scared me. Mm -hmm. Hell, I hadn't even worked on a computer. I was still writing my term papers on an electric typewriter where most of my friends had advanced to the word processor. So I was clearly out of my league. Seeking help from my professor was pointless. I was pawned off to a TA, and working with the TA would be even more challenging. I didn't understand the technical language, and he was pretty annoyed by my ignorance of computer programming. So I retreated and looked for friends that were taking computer science. But all of my friends were in drama, art, dance, and music. So that would be pointless. Enter Emil Carter, an upperclassman, a computer geek who actually spoke in layman's terms, and only one of two black men in the computer science program. He would spend 72 hours with me in the computer lab, helping me to develop a project, and then actually writing it for me. To this day, I could not tell you what the program was for or even how it worked. <laughs> so one thing that I learned from that experience is sometimes you have to look beyond the obvious when you're seeking resources and that I really need to dance to the beat of my own drum. I ended up graduating with a BA in World Arts and Cultures with a dance concentration, went on to earn a master's degree in cultural anthropology and organizational development, and then I earned a PhD in transformative learning with systems change. So when I met Yulkindi, this bright-eyed millennial, you know, the ones who know everything and have the answers <laughs> to all the questions, I thought, what could her situation have been like in college, and have things changed for women of color, especially women who are who will be the, the majority of the population by the year 2060. Thank you, Sonia. I remember saying to you, I've been asking myself the same thing as I look into the future. Will things ever change for women of color? On my end, I was born in 1995, a few years away from you, Sonia, <laughs> in a small town in the Dominican Republic called Haina, which is now filled with an industrial zone, refineries, and locals hard at work punching the clock to support the offshoring operations of corporations around the world. I was born to teenage parents who fell out of love quickly, as often happens at that age, and separated. But for some reason, they both ended up here in the United States. I ended up staying growing up with my grandparents until my time came for me to also move to the US. I remember picturing big city lights and big buildings, and of course, eating large french fries at the nearest <laughs> McDonald's. But my visa took a little longer than expected, five years to be exact, and for those years, I remained separated from my mother, who was undocumented in the States. But my visa finally came at the age of 10, going on 11. But when I finally landed here, I didn't see any big city lights. I landed in the good old Midwest, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> but 
I would also come during breaks and the holidays, not too far from here, to Rochester, New York, to spend time with my dad's side of the family. Anyways, when I came here, I didn't know a word of English, but I ended up taking this little American thing called spelling bees. I became obsessed with learning the language. I would read the dictionary from A through Z, and even took up some Disney Channel to supplement <laughs> my learning. I got so good that I represented the, Nash, the state of Missouri in the National Spelling Bee. <laughs> Top media outlets were impressed. They couldn't believe a Latino, let alone an Afro-Latina, made it this far in the competition. Headlines would read, Latina of the day, immigrant of the day, when you go to comments written about me in these articles, some comments will say, stop taking our jobs. I'm like, I'm 14, I don't have a job. <laughs> or go back to your country. This was the first time I felt the impact of race. Yes, I knew I was always black and a Latina, but this was the first time I felt the limitations of being from a certain racial category. However, I felt more motivated than ever. I now understood that representation truly matters. So I wanted to take all these energy to fuel my next dream. I wanted to take on corporate America <laughs> and be the big shot tech CEO, the next female Steve Jobs, actually that was my high school superlative in the yearbook, or the next Mark Zuckerberg. As you can see, my predecessors look a little different than me, <laughs> but I'm sure I own a black turtleneck somewhere <laughs> or a hoodie. But you know who's making everybody run for their money? Jeff Bezos with his black leather jacket. But I'm, I'm sure I can pull that off as well. Anyways, I did it. I got to business school. I started navigating these tech ecosystems. But when I got there, I never felt so isolated, undervalued, and invisible. So the story that I share with you that I was proud of became taboos and stigmas in the workplace. Being first-generation college student, low income from an immigrant family. So I quit. I dropped out of the workforce. So Sonia, I think change is not happening fast enough. So the real question is, will things ever change for women of color in this country? Well, time will only tell. As I listen to your story, um, I think about how much work we still have to do, which is why we've decided to really dig deeper into women of color and tech. Let's look at the statistics. White men are 41% more likely than white women to hold executive positions, 260% more likely than Asian women, 318% more than black women, and 438% more than Latinx women. In secondary school, only 4% of high school students taking AP computer science courses were Latinx girls. 2% were black girls and less than 1% were Native American or Alaska Native girls. When we move on to the college level, we see that women of color make up less than 10% of all bachelor degree earners in computing science, with black women only constituting 3% and Asian women comprising 2%, with also Latinx women, 2%. We know that women earn 21% of all doctorate degrees in computer science. However, less than 5% are available to non-Asian women of color. Let's look at the workforce and technology. Amongst all the women that are employed in computer science and information, Occupations, only 12% are black or Latinx women. In Silicon Valley, where I live in California, 2% of the workforce is comprised of non-Asian women of color. Less than 1% of the tech leadership are held by Latinx women and less than 0.5% held by black women. So we definitely have a long ways to go. You know, when we think about the data, um, it's, it's alarming, or it should be alarming. So our organizations, Yulkindi's organization Forefront and my organization Leader Spring Center has been working with the k Center in Oakland, California over the last year. 
We've been working in this collaborative called the Women of Color in Computing Research Collaborative. KPOR actually funds many research grants <coughs> that seek to develop, test, and scale strategies to diversify the technology workforce. Our organizations have been working over the last year holding focus groups throughout the country in cities like San Francisco, Boston, Columbus, Ohio, and right here in New York. What we have found is that our research is actually focusing on four areas. Agency or our own power in the workplace, mentorship and sponsorships that lead towards career advancement, feedback and communication loops at work, and then managing bias. So as we look at this, you look, Indy, tell me, what have we learned? Yes, what we found was incredible. It wasn't that these women felt that they didn't have the technical skills to succeed in their roles. What we heard were stories like this. Consider participant A who shared, I work at a very, very white company. I have an interesting background in both marketing and engineering, but I spend time in many meetings with my colleagues with no engineering background, questioning my knowledge and even explaining how email works. This could be very frustrating and it made my job really hard, especially after I saw a colleague get more credit for the work that I was doing. Consider participant B who said, I remember being super, super excited to participate in this client project. The whole team was involved. I thought I was perfect for it. I triple check everything. I'm very detail oriented, especially right before handing off my deliverables to a direct report. And I remember my manager at the time, who was also new to the firm. She had asked me to see my progress. And I was so excited to share my deliverable with her and awaiting her feedback for further improvements. Instead, what I got was a very upsetting interaction. My manager would approach me second after second, questioning everything that I have written. I felt like a dog. I consider quitting because I hated how it felt. And for months afterwards, I wonder if it was because I was young or Lionx. We don't have a pipeline issue here. It's not that women are not interested in engineering or are not aspiring to be in technology roles or don't have the skills. In fact, the opposite could not be more true. Women of color are the most powerful group in the workforce and if leveraged can foster innovation and growth for our entire country. What we need is a narrative shift. Shift away from the angry black women stereotype, for instance, to the powerful, resilient, and intelligent women of color. Hashtag black girl magic. So some will say there are no top candidates for the jobs. And some will say, well, you know, we want to hire, but women of color just aren't interested in computer science or technology. Well, we know that's a bunch of BS. We are more than what you just see on the surface. We are leaders. We are VPs and CEOs and tech specialists. And we're also genius. We actually navigate the world a little bit differently. So when we look at our sisters, we really want to give, give homage. We want to um, recognize their accomplishments. We want to recognize their aspirations. And as Afro-Latinas and as black women, we wanted this talk to be a love letter to our sisters to women of color of all kinds. We know we can build a better country once we accommodate to the needs of women of color. Here's how you can help. Number one, celebrate and listen and acknowledge women of color. Number two, be an ally without being patronizing and condescending. We welcome collaborative partnerships. Number three, recommend women of color for jobs and opportunities. And four, support women of color, small businesses and organizations through time, talent, and of course, money. <laughs> if you are interested in learning more about this topic and getting a copy of our final report, please feel free to go to this link, bit.ly slash WOC research. Thank you so much. Thank you.